Good morning and welcome. We'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. I have 10:59, and we'll we'll start at 11 and 30 seconds. I'll let people get get logged in. All right, we'll just wait just about a half a minute and see people that are logging in. Great. And then we'll get started. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. This is Joanne Gear. I'm the Executive Director for the Westchester Biotech Project. And we're very excited to have you with us for our first official session of uh, 2020, the new decade, on aligning academic and career advising with student experience. Um, this conversation came out of discussions with a number of people and uh, We'll, uh, you'll be learning more about that shortly. I'll share with you just a, a couple of things to expect. First of all, this session is being recorded and we post on our YouTube channel just the first session with the official speakers and the, uh, during the round table, we, if, if we want to, if somebody says something really interesting during the round table portion, which comes afterward, if we want to quote you, we will ask you first. Um, the uh, uh, I want to introduce my partner, uh, Michael Welling. He's going to tell you a little bit about our, our organization, and then we'll get started. I would also ask that um, if you're not speaking, would you mute yourself, and that way we won't get any of your background noise. Michael Welling, would you like to say good morning? Thank you, Joanne. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us on our first event of the new year, and a, a new year that... Uh, is setting up to be uh, certainly uh, one of our biggest and most impactful years uh, with many exciting uh, events, activities, and initiatives on the horizon. Um, as Joanne said, sort of today is really intriguing, uh, not just the topic, but also the manner in which this opportunity uh, to make an impact in this area came about, and you'll hear more of that from the folks today. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome, thank you. Um, Joanne and I kicked off the Westchester Biotech Project about three years ago, uh, really set out to accomplish what you're going to see today, bringing uh, like-minded and interested uh, stakeholders and, and contributors from around uh, our community and the region um, to have meaningful and impactful conversations uh, in areas that uh, maybe additional collaboration is needed, um, different collaboration is needed. Uh, we know there's a lot of great work being done out there in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector, in the public sector, in the academic sector. Uh, and we've just really found a, a, a fascinating way to, to bring everyone together and, and further these conversations. Um, part of that initiative is what we refer to, as you'll see on the screen here, our Westchester Biotech Blueprint 2030. Uh, we have uh, taken the lead in a conversation uh, that involves, again, bringing together all these stakeholders and mapping out a plan with how to further our community. Um, there is, as I said, amazing work being done in all of these sectors. Uh, and the opportunity to bring them all together uh, and sort of uh, align interests and focus and efforts 
uh, is something that we, we've seen a, a great need for. And so this is a, not just a, a physical document we are working on, but it's a concept, it's a strategy, uh, something that really permeates everything that we're doing and much with everything else uh, that we do. If you personally find uh, a particular item of interest or uh, an idea that you think is warrants con contribution, we welcome your your input and your feedback. And, and this really is a, a collective effort um, that we put forth on this. Uh, along the lines of exciting things that are happening, and it feels like uh, we're I'm losing track of all the exciting things I think that are going to unfold here in 2020. Uh, but one of them is the uh, uh, opening of the Ardsley Park facility, which uh, last update we had may be around June of this year. Uh, but Biomed Realty Trust, who is a, a significant global player in the management of biotech research and laboratory space, uh, owns some property here in Westchester uh, that they've committed to a fairly significant capital investment in. Uh, and and targeting an opening of around June. And what's really exciting about this, aside from being state of the art, uh, but the flexibility that they are baking into this, both from square feet and lease terms uh, and utilization of, of the infrastructure there uh, is something that we know when uh, taken into account with some of the other projects that are happening here in Westchester, uh, this is really going to put us in a position to uh, allow our companies who are in Westchester now to grow, uh, but also put us in a position to attract uh, companies from outside the region to set up shop here uh, and contribute. And that really speaks to sort of our topic today as we try and align the interests of our students here in Westchester uh, with the needs of the jobs of the future. This is a great sort of complement to those efforts. Uh, as with everything we do uh, today and everything else would not be possible uh, without the contributions and the support of all of our partners. Uh, and truthfully, that it's the, the list of our partners is expanding. Uh, we almost can't keep up with it. But we credit all of these companies and entities here for their time, uh, their financial support, uh, their thought leadership, and everything that we're doing. Uh, and as I always say, should there be anyone on this list that you uh, want to learn more about, that you have some interest in engaging, uh, please reach out to us. We love making these introductions, and we really believe that uh, that sort of collaborative environment we've created is a, is a, a key to our success and allowing us to, to sort of push forward. Uh, and at the bottom right-hand corner, I wanted to also highlight our Westchester Biotech Project Europe Partnership. Uh, that we have structured. We, we are, we say borderless initiative, and while we have Westchester in our name, uh, that is only to highlight all the great work that's being done here, not to solely focus our efforts on what is going on here. So we have partnerships around the region, around the country, around the globe at the moment, uh, and we really believe as these facilities come online, as some of the new initiatives you'll hear about uh, over the next few weeks and months come to, to, to light, uh, the ability to bring uh, individuals, companies, contributions from, from the European community uh, is going to really prove to be a game changer for all that we're trying to do here. Uh, lastly, and, and we, I, I always end my little introduction here with one of Joanne's favorite quotes, uh, we always over, overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. While we are very much focused on what we're doing today and tomorrow and the next two years, uh, we have really tried to take a long-term view of the work that we're doing and positioning our, ourselves, and by ourselves I mean our collective selves, uh, to be in, in a position in five and ten years uh, to hopefully be a, a community of biotech companies, healthcare companies, data science companies, uh, where people say, hey, I, I need something, let me reach out to the folks at, in Westchester. We believe that is coming, uh, and we are just proud and honored and humbled to be a part of this and sort of help shepherd these conversations and uh, bring all of you together. So I, I, I thank you in advance for your time today, your contributions, uh, and excited to sort of further the dialogue. Thank you, Michael. 
Um, <clears throat> so we're going to hear first from uh, Dr. Harla Romney, who is the Director for Ed Education Strategies for the Westchester Biotech Project, and is also the Director of Research for the Boston University School of Medicine City Lab. Carla, you could take it away. Okay, so I unmuted. So how do, does this sound okay That's right now? Sounds good. I know we you had some good. static earlier. We're good? No, you, you okay. sound good. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure before I <laughs> launched into this. So actually, Appreciate it's really you. great to, to hear the, Michael's comments, showing your comments, and certainly I'm looking forward to hearing the comments from everybody else in just a little while. The educational piece for um, the Westchester Biotech Project and for the count the county the community the greater you know Hudson Valley area greater New York, New York State yeah and, and as broadly writ as you want to take this is essential for us to really consider in the sense that growing the biotech and growing stem in general um, depends on starting early persisting and introducing students their parents, guardians, families, educators, guidance counselors, academic advisors to the world of STEM. And at the risk of quoting, I think it was Hillary Clinton, that it takes a village. It really does take more than the little villages that we have in Westchester, um, collectively working together. It takes everybody's efforts to really begin to open students' eyes to the tremendous opportunities that are available within the biotech world and, again, also within the STEM world. And as we think about trying to build a sustainable biotech community in Westchester, one of the essential pieces to making that a reality is having a workforce that can contribute, that can be employed and by companies in the area. And yet we are really at a very early stage in the process of building out the kinds of opportunities that are needed and building out the awareness within our communities. And I'm thinking in that context about families in general within the schools and school districts as well of really trying to open people's eyes to these opportunities. In general, the focus is often on what a student should study. If you think about the transition, for example, from high school to college, the guidance counselors in high school, oh, you're good at X, therefore you should study Y in college. But there's very little broad understanding that in fact the biotech community depends upon people who do marketing, who have com marketing communication skills. It depends on lawyers, it depends on accountants. In addition to the scientists, engineers, data analysts, and all of the other more, what I would argue are more traditional, more traditionally perceived roles within the biotech world. And so as we start to think about how we need to build a strategy. That's not me. I hear. Thanks, know, thanks, that's... Carla. Uh, can I request anybody who's not speaking now? Would Would you please mute yourself? Thank you so much. I, Go I ahead, don't Carla. Think that was me. I'm sorry. If it was, I think it's better now. I'm sorry. I I don't. There was no noise here. Um, anyway, um, but the idea of really trying to think about how we start to en er engage early, early on uh, stakeholders in building this, uh, building interest in STEM and biotech is crucially important to moving forward and building a viable component of the Westchester and Greater Hudson Valley uh, community. And so in thinking about that, um, a couple of thoughts that I know that some of um, my colleagues are also going to comment on are think, thinking about how cross-institutionally we can think about how we can provide volunteer and internship opportunities, how we can help advisors, guidance counselors understand the opportunities that don't really exist necessarily in the area right now, but will be here 
you know, as, as Michael's quote said, they're going to be here before we know it. How do we help to engage them in understanding these opportunities and foster their ability to encourage students to pursue pathways, educational pathways, career pathways that can prepare them to enter these fields? So I, I in addition, I think we also need to consider, excuse me, how we guide students to careers within biotech and STEM. And again, thinking broadly about this, it's not, while the science is crucial and build, you know, building a science workforce, whether it's the PhD level scientists, the master's level scientists, the um, bachelor's level scientists, the associates trained, the certificate trained, right? All of these are integral to, to having a sustainable sector of the economy in the area. And so as we look across our institutions, we need to think about how our K-12 pipeline builds support for these programs and how we can work across our institutional boundaries in some senses to promote opportunities for students to move from their K-12 world into our local um, community college and undergrad institutions, and then ultimately down the road, if they choose to pursue it to directly into their career paths or into a more advanced education. And in that spirit, one of the activities with which I and many others in the area have been involved with is building something that the Westchester Biotech Project is now calling the Westchester Certificate, which really is an opportunity that we're hoping to offer through Westchester Community College in the very near term for, stu for students of all K-12 and undergrad and beyond, as well as for example, uh, returning veterans, we, you know, many different populations of people who might want to consider careers in biotech to develop basic lab competencies so that they become employable in our area. Um, and certainly this, among other activities, is one of the things that I welcome all of you, and I know Joanne and Michael certainly would also encourage any of you that have an interest in this idea of building careers to really think about how we can build this out further and market and disseminate it uh, within the area. I think one other m message that I'd like to share is particularly an issue at the undergraduate level. And that is, and certainly I know there are some of you from undergrad institutions um, and, and um, even grad institutions that have strong undergrad components, is how, thinking about ways in which we can play a key role in changing the mindset of undergraduates who, are, who enter undergrad as pre-medical, pre-dent, pre-veterinary -vet students opt out of that path, likely due to its perceived and real rigor, and see opting into a career in STEM or into biotech as a failure. And rather than the success that it really is and can be for them. And so, as we think about how advisors play an integral role in helping students transition from one field to another, one of the key pieces is in building a positive outlook towards careers in STEM and seeing them as viable, attractive, lucrative, professionally and intellectually rewarding career opportunities and thinking about ways in which we as a community can start that dialogue across our institutions, I think is a key piece in having undergrad prepared and ultimately hopefully some graduate prepared individuals coming out through our, our institutions in the area. Another piece that I'd like us to also think a little bit about today is ways in which teachers in the K-12 world work with guidance counselors in the K-12 world and the way faculty in colleges and universities pair with and partner with the career services or 
the equivalent types of offices that engage in career development and postgraduate study. In many institutions across the nation, not just in, in the Westchester area, these connections are virtually non-existent. And there are, we are starting to see some fledgling efforts locally where there are starting to be these kinds of partnerships. And building this out may be a strategy to help encourage students to persist in these fields. And so I hope that as we move forward in some of today's conversation, we can share some of the emerging best practices from across our institutions, from our own, our own experiences you know, firsthand, as well as those that we've seen or heard or read about um, that might be worth bringing and trying locally. And so in that spirit, I know Michael and or Joanna will likely speak a little bit more about the Westchester Biotech Project's Career Consortium. But this is an opportunity for everybody on this call, as well as others, to further engage in conversations about how we can build the career pipelines within our area. So I think I'll stop there in terms of framing some of these essential issues and, and then pass this back to Joanne, I guess, who's moderating, and then we can move forward from there. Thank you, Carla, and thank you for that uh, heads up on the Career Consortium, which I really consider this is almost a kickoff conversation today. Um, and the two areas that you highlight are ones that we've heard from many different sectors. The combination of needing to get into the imagination of young people much younger and to align between what the opportunities of the future look like and what educators can do today. Um, and I will just add to that uh, uh, concept of the, of the consortium is that um, a lot of uh, the institutions in our area don't really have the depth of uh, capacity to really build a robust internship pipeline. And we think that that's a place that we can really be helpful with. Um, and I won't get into depth about that, but it is a place where we are welcoming um, participation from all the institutions and of course all the different companies that we talk to. You know, there are a lot of small companies in our area that could provide a really interesting internship experience but kind of need some hand-holding to figure out how to do it and how to make it part of their workflow and uh, that's a role that we are uh, embarking on uh, as well. So thank you. I'm going to introduce now our next speaker who is Megan McCarthy who is the director for uh, the Center for Career Development at Manhattanville College. And Megan, I'm going to make you the presenter. I'm sure this is going to go very smoothly like it did before. Very happy to, see a nice <laughs> happy to see a nice cohort of people participating today. Let's see, I'm making you the presenter. And um, I will share that after Megan speaks, and then we're going to hear from Rich Person from Iona. After that, we're going to open up uh, for a round table and everyone is invited to participate. We'll call on you to invite you to share your work and any questions or comments that you have. Um, Annette, Annette, I'm, I'm uh, uh, warning you, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna invite you to go first. That's why I'm very happy you got your, uh, uh, your, your call in set up. I put in the, if, if you don't have a microphone on your computer, uh, I put in the chat the call-in number for you to, to come by phone. So you don't have to do that right now. It'll be a little while. But when we get to that part, that would be your way to participate. There you go, Megan. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone see my slides? Yes? Did it work? Yes, yes. yes it worked. Okay. <laughs> So I had um, a huge smile on my face when Carla mentioned that it takes a village because I feel that that is something that I, you know, once I got to the table where I could say it takes a village, this is what it needs to be. But uh, so as, as Joanne mentioned, my, my title is within the career development umbrella. And I want to start off with what I call an all too familiar story. This is actually how Joanne and I uh, first 
got on this conversation, this topic of conversations involving career development and academic affairs and, and really how it takes a village. So it was, this is specific story that happened Nick, over the I'm, summer. Yes. I'm so sorry. I'm going to interrupt you there. Um, anybody who has your camera on, it's a good idea to turn it off because it will affect uh, your, everybody's being recorded and Sharetta Robson, I see you. If you could re uh, turn your uh, camera off, you will actually probably get better results on the slides. Sure. Okay. So okay. this was... There you go. Not a problem. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, as the career umbrella, I received many phone calls from parents where the conversation of their child is used with plural pronouns like we, we go to this school, we pay this much money, we want to be a doctor, and uh, over the summer this was no different. I had a, a mother who, her daughter goes to Manhattanville and she was introduced to me as pre-med, had just finished her first year. I got a little backstory of her daughter's high school career, you know, the APs, the IB program, really gung-ho. Her son wanted to do uh, engineering side of STEM. He was a uh, electrical or biomedical engineering student out on Long Island. And, you know, as much as I love talking to parents, I kept referring the mother to to have the daughter either come in or call, that that's really where the meat and potatoes of our work comes into play. And so about a week later, the, the student comes in, and she's lovely, and she is very articulate, and she is telling me that she wants to be a pediatric cardiologist, and, you know, we're, we're having these wonderful conversations, and then I get to the point about her classes. How did bio go? Chem, calculus, how are you doing with those traditional STEM courses? Come to find out that in the entire first year, she hadn't taken a single one. She wanted to focus on the liberal arts side of education, so she took creative writing and an art class and a dance class. And in my head, I then go to, okay, we're going to talk about <laughs> really her course schedule and, and getting in touch with our pre-health advisors and, and how to get involved on campus. And then I make the assumption that she's doing really well in these courses. She wasn't. Uh, she finished her first year with a 2.0 and really had a hard time sitting in her classes. And um, I just kept being knocked down in my expectations of where I thought this conversation would be going, and I realized that I had started to make classic assumptions that we've all made, and those are that students know where to find us, or students know how to, who to ask for help, or students know how to find their way. And, you know, Manhattanville College is a very small institution. I've been at larger institutions. And these are assumptions across the board that we all make. You know, everyone thinks that success is a straight line. And whether they have asked for help or whether they have found it on their own, that it is scaffolded in a way that makes sense. But that's not always the case, unfortunately. So I actually... The conversation that I had with her came into really the conversation that I would have with a student before they even started their first year in college and let her know that she might be taking a fifth year of undergraduate courses or, you know, how does she feel about taking classes over the summer um, and talking about gap years uh, and, and really discussing that, that full package of if she wanted to go to med school while also saying there are other professions within healthcare and STEM that I think could be really great for her. So similar to what Carla mentioned about the building the positive outlook in STEM and not just because you're not a, a pre-med track student doesn't mean that you can't be successful or that you can't be proud of the work that you do. And I was very pleased that the conversation turned out well 
in that she didn't know many of these jobs in STEM. You know, she mentioned that she loves writing, so we even discussed medical writing um, or research and marketing. And so how we tapped into those creative sides, and then it came to, well, I don't think my mom would like that. She wants me to be a doctor, lawyer, or an engineer. And I then pulled up, you know, ONET and, and looked at, um, you know, these, these really high paying jobs that she could do within the STEM industry without saying you're now dedicating 12 plus years to schooling and that's how that can be successful, um, which I thought was really fantastic. But we also, in, in career development, and I know there's a, a couple folks in the, in the career services side of the house on the call right now, so this is an all too familiar undergraduate timeline where students are focusing on the rigorous courses, the research, the clinicals, the exams, so whether that is, you know, the MCAT, the GRE, all of the above, applying to schools and or jobs, and it's not until they realize they're going to need to take a gap year in order to complete all the prerequisites, or they're waitlisted or rejected, that they come to career services for that plan B. And they see career services as this placement model, this transactional experience where they come in and they have no idea what they want to do because their plan A isn't working out the way they want. That timeline is, is off now. And so they come to us already anxiety ridden and sometimes angry or disgruntled and saying, I've paid all of this money and I'm here for my job. Why don't I have this job? And we tend to have to be both the bearer of bad news and say that that placement model of career services has really gone away uh, in the past few decades. I think, you know, uh, 1980s, 1990s were really the peak of that but also that the plan B shouldn't be seen as a failure, similar to how Carla mentioned, you know, we need to have the changing of these mindsets and we need to show that there are key roles out there uh, and right in our backyard of Westchester County where they can be successful and they can be proud and they don't have to feel the shame of disappointing their parents because they're not a doctor, lawyer, or engineer. And so, for the career services model, um, you know, I, I mentioned the changing evolution of what is going on. This is something that came out uh, about a month or two ago, and it's called the Evolution of Career Services in Higher Education. And what I really like about this is it talks about the need for starting early and it taking a village. You know, we need to customize connections and communities that extend responsibility for colleges, uh, for college employability beyond career centers. And that, you know, with the, the changing landscape of individuals who will be applying to college today, tomorrow, in the next 10, 15 years, you know, colleges and universities, we have a responsibility to prepare all of our students. You know, the, the changing student demographic has, has really altered the way in which colleges and universities both recruit uh, as well as interact with students. So we need to keep in mind that access and, and really truly equity are at the center of what we do. Um, and that's on us. So it can't be that traditional transactional model anymore that it needs to be at the forefront. So again, like Carla had mentioned, that starting early, you know, we have students that we can't make those assumptions that they know where to go or they know who to talk to. We have to be there and set that tone and say, this is who I am, this is how I can help, but also this is the village, this is the community in which we can help. Um, so it's, it's not just putting the pressure on the academic advisor or the career center or the faculty member, um, that it really, really looks at who we are. Um, I also want to just throw out some numbers in terms of, you know, where we are, Gallup, uh, I think in 2016 came out with a poll that said only about 52% of students use career services. And of that, that, that same number 
about 86% of incoming uh, first-year students said that getting a better job is a critical factor in their decision to enroll in college. That's up about 13% from uh, 2000 to 2009. So we are now seeing that you know, with, the, with the price tag that colleges and universities have, these students are expecting a quality, uh, not necessarily pre-professional or vocational focus, but that we are able to meet the needs of a new, this new generation. And there needs to be an integrated approach. Um, and that also goes into what employers are looking for. So the idea of soft skills are kind of going by the wayside. And we're focusing more on success skills. You know, employers are not necessarily willing or able to train a student on those work skills or, you know, as NACE uh, calls, core competencies. There is an expectation that all applicants and all new hires can be, you know, problem solving, critical thinking, have strong oral and written communication skills, know how to collaborate, are exposed to digital technology, po possess some sort of leadership skill work ethic, career management, and also intercultural fluency. But also, if we're looking at this, this is from the World Economic Forum, the skills from 2015 to 2020 haven't necessarily changed that much, but the order has. And now we're looking at you know, creativity being more at the top, as well as, you know, I think critical thinking is always going to play a role but I was actually most surprised that active listening isn't there anymore, but it's replaced with emotional intelligence. So it's coming to, yes, you have the rigorous classes, classwork, but there needs to be that whole package and that holistic approach to student development. And that shouldn't be on any singular person at an institution's shoulders. So one of the things that, or really four of the things that I think uh, universities are starting to look at are academic integration. So there are more and more uh, career centers reporting to academic affairs now. And I say that because I've worked at Manhattanville for two years. And as of December 1, my office is now has switched from student affairs to academic affairs with this intentional portion coming in where if we want to say that we are able to meet all students or at least expose what we do to all students, we have to meet them where all students are, and that's in the classroom. Every student has that academics component. This is how we get to it. Uh, and so we need to look at not necessarily going in and saying, here's how to be successful with this major, but incorporating shared governance. So going and talking to students at larger uh, areas. So it's not just the one-on-one -on -one or waiting for them to come to us. We need to go to them. We need to explain that we need to infuse you know, connections and immersive experiences. So the Westchester Biotech Certificate is crucial, I think, as is the connecting with these companies that, you know, I always say to students, just because it's a smaller biotech company doesn't mean that they don't need an intern or someone to help them. They just don't have the time to post something. So you should be proactive and reach out and call them or email them. We also need to look at scalable structures. So if we're looking at going from service you know, provided to 52% of students to 100% of students, how do we do that without being over capacity? You know, with this is a very tech heavy world that we live in. No one should be working 24 seven and feeling burnt out. I think that's something that many of us in higher ed deal with. So how do we transfer our budgets going from these transactional services and these one-on-one -on -one appointments to 
rethinking the core structure and, and using our staff more effectively. That doesn't necessarily mean losing that human component or those human touches, but ensuring that students who need that individual help are served the most while providing that same level of information to everyone. You know, um, success skills. I have said it before and I'll say it again, I am a huge fan of design thinking. I love the idea of life design. I will pitch it wherever and whenever possible. I teach a course in the fall here that is called Designing Your Life, which is taken from Burnett and Evans. But this is really a way in which, similarly to what Carla said, is talking about changing the mindset and having it be how do you and your skills fit multiple industries, multiple fields, and how can you tailor yourself to these different areas without feeling that if you don't get into uh, med school that you are a failure, you can still be successful and perhaps more successful um, within different areas of the STEM industry, you know, building out awareness from an early you know, I always say, you're not necessarily failing, you're just changing directions, and you can change your mind at any point. Gone are the days where people have one career for life. It is more about themselves and their tra trajectory and, and how they can be successful. So, you know, how can we sustain this change um, by making what we do high tech and high touch to facilitate access uh, to and inform all students about the best way to leverage their networks, experiences, and opportunities. So that could be working with uh, a mentor program. That could be having them attend conferences or shadowing opportunities. It's, it's whatever your, their imagination will let them do. And then finally, measuring impact. So from the career development standpoint, we are so used to measuring outcomes within the first destination survey. So when a senior is ready to graduate or you know, someone in graduate school is ready to, to leave, when do they get that job and, and how much do they make? And, and, but very rarely do we ask, are they satisfied with that job? Is it what they wanted? Uh, so I think we really need to start working backwards and identifying how many of our students early on are engaged. So there's a growing, um, a growing movement within you know, career development about starting to measure how many students are applying to internships, to fellowships, to graduate schools. Uh, and then looking at that number and saying, okay, and how many, what percentage of those applicants are getting those outcomes? Um, and then also in terms of moving from satisfaction surveys to net promoter scores, you know, which measures the willingness of customers, or in this case students, to recommend the products and services of a company, or in this case, the college and university. That is something that I think when going back to the, the success or how we promote uh, colleges when it comes to the en enrollment management side is really important. So rather than a parent or a student coming to the career development table and saying, if I go here, will I get a job? And if so, where will that be? You know, we can also say, here's where students have gone in the last year, five years, but also, this is how satisfied they are, or this is you know, how many of our students engage early and take advantage of these opportunities. Um, but you know, by tracking the, the students that have applied and then going into the outcomes, we're able to say not only this is the success, but this is how we support students in their progress towards career outcomes or you know, looking at um, their, their career management. Um, which I think is really great, but with that, we also need to look at redefining the narrative um, of career and academics and, and student success so it is not transactional, that it is integrated directly into the, the central core of 
uh, the academics portion of college because that has always been the heart of the education and we need to put in beyond the four years or beyond the two years and, and have it be rather than reactive, have students become more proactive, but that becomes how are we messaging and branding ourselves and having it be so we're reaching across the table and not sitting back idly and hoping that students know where to find us. Um, so that's a little bit about um, what I'm talking about. It's more of a work in progress than anything. You know, I would love to see a college and, or university that does this perfectly, where there's no bumps, there's no headache or heartache. It's always a work in progress. Um, but going back to it takes a village, it really does. And that village is growing. So it's beyond the campus. It's talking about local and national and international employers. It's talking about our alumni and, and our government. Um, the, the wider we cast that net, the more engaged and involved. And hopefully the easier it will be to hit this capacity, this need for interns, these needs for jobs, uh, and this need for really positive and fulfilling careers. So that's my spiel. I look forward to the discussion um, and also hearing what Richard has to say. Well, thank you, Megan. This is fantastic. I'm going to move right up to you, Rich. Uh, I'm going to find you on my screen here, and I'm going to make you okay. the presenter. Okay. And there you go. Okay. So now I'm as the presenter. Let's see. You should you have seeing? a little pop-up. Not, not yet. You should have something that asks you if you want to show your screen. Yep. Here we go. Just came up. Good. Can you see? There you are. Perfect. And your full Good. screen. Go, go ahead on. Thank you. All right. <laughs> well, I really am very happy to be here today because for a very long time, since 2014, I've participated in the Dean's Advisory Board at Iona College. And a lot of people ask me, what is that? Well, quite interestingly, it's a, really the brainchild of a former dean, Sibdis Gosh, who came up with this idea of actually increasing the base of support for the college, uh, improving its overall outreach to the community at large, strengthening its internal programs, and really overall giving opportunities for students to enhance their education through internships, mentoring, and experiential learning. And I think the previous speakers have really highlighted just how important that is and also have given an opportunity to Westchester Biotech to provide a certificate-based approach to this and giving the skills to students at levels that may even reach into the late high school, intermediate, and college levels. So let's just take a look for a minute at something which it's not responding, let me put, there we go. So the objectives of today's talk for me are to identify the missing skills that employees, excuse me, employers expect new hires to have. To briefly discuss who can fill the skill gaps, to discuss the main problems with onboarding. Now onboarding is the costs associated with and the programs associated with bringing a new hire into the workforce. And finally, something that really doesn't get very much lip service anymore, and that is, are there any quality improvement goals set by colleges and universities? And who actually administers those quality improvement goals? And who actually measures the improvement? Today's graduates really lack some of the fundamental skills that we've discussed previously today, and that really is an overall look at what they are. Writing competence. I've actually had the chance to look at a lot of what's happening with regard to students' capabilities to write. I'm a professional technical writer, so to some extent I come with a different purview of the entire process. But 
Writing competence has really gone down tremendously in the last 50 years. Yes, 50 years. I celebrated my golden anniversary with Iona College this year. I started in 1965 and graduated in 69. And over the years, I've been in contact with the college and looked at a lot of different people in the college to see how I could help. And writing competence is probably one of the most important things that gets somehow through the cra cracks. And of course, now with the me, my, now generation, everything is a quip, a tweet, or an instant message. So the whole concept of pulling together a lot of very interesting ideas into a paragraph, putting the paragraph into a chapter, putting the chapter into a book, seems to have been lost along the way. Public speaking proficiency is another area. A lot of students have really, really come a long way in this, particularly in the mass communications area, but the rest of STEM, and I've noticed this too with a lot of presentations from the science students, really do lack the public speaking proficiency. Data analysis. I'm not talking about heavy duty data analysis, but I'm talking about the fundamentals of looking at a series of results and coming up with a description of what those results mean. Basic software knowledge, things like QuickBooks, project management, Salesforce, these are the things that ultimately a new hire will come in contact with at a new job. And they're just not there. So then the onboarding costs go up because the hiring managers have to make sure that these people get trained in these verticals that they need. Basic math skills are absent. Design and presentation skills are also very deficient. We are very <clears throat> much uh, deficient in multiple languages. We either have an ESL, English as Second Language situation, or we have a very poor <laughs> response to learning another language in the colleges. In fact, Iona College used to have lots of different courses and majors in foreign languages. And over the last 50 years, they've just virtually disappeared. And as previously Megan mentioned, marketing fundamentals are essential. And most of the students coming out of school today totally lack an awareness of marketing and how that relates to the STEM courses they're taking. So the most essential career skills, and Megan highlighted many of these, are critical thinking and problem solving, attention to detail, clear, concise communication, and ownership and leadership. I'm gonna concentrate on the last one. We don't talk about ownership very much, but as Megan said, parents now, the helicopter parents has come in and talk in the we. We must get through this, we must do that. In my day, and I sound like an old man, and I am, <laughs> uh, basically my parents didn't even know what I was doing in college. And so it was a, it was a very solo journey. And I had to make my way because my parents did not have an education beyond the eighth grade. And as a result, there was nothing really I could go to as a resource other than the career counselors at the time, which really weren't very much there because the Jerry Roop Center had not even been invented yet. So going through the entire process, I relied heavily on my peers and also my professors. And they were very helpful, but again, no real directive in letting me know where I was supposed to go and what I was supposed to do. And I was a pre-med bio biologist. I ended up as a clinical chemist. So obviously I sidelined the entire process of becoming a doctor and had a very lucrative career in clinical chemistry that ultimately led into software and finally into data analysis with Oracle Corporation. So then who can fill these skill gaps? Well, is it the college career counselor? Well, is it the headhunter? Is it the workforce resource manager? Or are you gonna throw it to the individual themselves? And I think that we do need a skill gap bridge between academia and the workforce. And again, that gives an opportunity to Westchester Biotech to get that process flow from the actual degree into the job well-defined. There are several problems with onboarding. First of all, organizations develop onboarding programs to enhance the new employee engagement, 
to improve their overall retention statistics. But if you will go out to new employees and ask them, well, how well did we do with regard to the onboarding? Only 12% of them will strongly agree that the organization did a great job. That means the rest of those people did not feel that they were really properly brought into the organization. And the biggest problem is that the organizational, organizational culture usually does not get revealed during the onboarding process. When you really look at who leaves an organization and why, many, many times it's because of the organizational culture and the backbiting, the expectation levels, what's not talked about. This can be very, very disturbing for somebody not to understand exactly what's expected when they get into the organization and leads to a lot of dissatisfaction. So as a result of this, there are a lot of cottage onboarding facilities that have sprung up probably in the last 10 to 15 years. And these people will come in and try to give the onboarding experience a priority within the organization and teach the organization what they need to understand about bringing new people in and make it a smoother transition. But I'm going to ask you, and maybe this can come up in the discussion, what else is missing? Overall, I think the biggest opportunity that we have and something that is virtually impossible for me to sell to academia right now is the quality improvement process. I was lucky enough to actually work with Dr. Duran when he was alive uh, with Duran Quality Programs. And the Duran Quality process is well-defined from the standpoint of what they do for bringing people to an awareness of planning, control, and improvement. First of all, quality planning, which is an activity of developing the products and processes required to meet customers' needs. Well, in academia, who are the customers? Well, the customers are the people paying for the service. Unfortunately, people don't really want to accept the fact that students are the customers. So I think overall, we need to establish quality goals, determine what the customer's needs specifically are. And I think Megan and, and uh, everyone that spoke, to, actually Megan did a fantastic job outlining that. We also have to understand what the process controls will be to help people become what they need to become in the workforce. So this is a very, very important concept. And I think that we have to go into Dr. Duran's book and understand continuous improvement and the opportunities that we have in the overall improvement process. One thing that's not been discussed and seems to come up most times is what it costs to actually provide career services in an organization. And this is where, if you really look closely at Harvard, Stanford, Cornell, MIT, they have hundreds of millions of dollars in these processes. In fact, in 2017, Harvard University took in $1.28 billion of additional money for the overall operations of the college. And that's pretty good to help them meet a lot of their goals. So I think that this is something that we really have to consider and also look into more carefully. Perhaps a quality improvement program would be useful in the overall career development process. Any questions or comments? Well, I guess we'll go. Joanne? Thank you, thank you. This is fantastic. Um, I am going to take back the screen. And um, I like this young woman. She's kind of our, our, uh, our mascot now. She, she, she speaks to me of the people that we work with. I'm going to invite folks on the call now uh, I'm going to start with Annette McLaughlin from uh, Fordham. Uh, would you just talk a little bit, uh, Annette, about what's going on at Fordham? And then, you know, I know our time is a little bit short, so um, but I, will, I do want to get everyone on the call to have a chance to introduce themselves because I think we have a really wonderful cohort here uh, today. And I imagine that there'll be other activities we'll want to do in the future and maybe an in-person meeting at some point. Uh, but Annette, would you like to say hello and talk about what's going on at Fordham? 